When I say the most useless Star Trek starship, I am sure you'll have some ideas that come to mind. Is it the USS Enterprise J? Because some of you really don't like it. Perhaps the Nova class of being tiny. Or maybe, just maybe, you agree with us that it's the Oberth class starship. Just look at it. It's like they had a spare part kicking around from a catamaran and said, sure, why not, that'll work. As a Starfleet workhorse, the Oberth class quickly gained a brilliant reputation. And that reputation was, of course, one of the worst, most easily destroyed Starfleet ships in history. Easily beating the number of times the Enterprise D exploded each season of the next generation. Honestly, shocking. Go, let's go! I didn't spend seven fucking years on a goddamn over to get knocked down to station position. Welcome to Trek Central, I'm your host Captain Jack, and don't forget if you want more Star Trek news, lore, and more, then hit that follow and subscribe button. Okay, here we go. The Oberth class, despite its abhorrent design, could fulfill several mission parameters. It was a rapid and easy to build design and was primarily used by Starfleet and civilian scientists over nearly a century between the 2280s and the mid 2370s. This type can cover a range of mission profiles, scout class, science vessel, transport supply ship. It was primarily used to conduct and research missions and often deployed to analyze unusual spatial phenomena. Early ships were only armed with one forward phaser bank. I'm willing to bet the crews of this class would be swallowing their chairs every time they embarked on a mission that even remotely seemed like it could go wrong. Now, later designs did include a port, starboard emitter, and single torpedo launcher. With only 13 decks with a standard 80 headcount, it could function with a bare minimum of 5 crew members. It was a minuscule 120 meters in length, equivalent to a full size Premier League football pitch. Americans, you know what I mean, don't lie. Although recognisable as a Starfleet ship, it did have a weird layout. It's not conventional in any way. Notably, it's a secondary hull connected by pylons off the struts of the nacelles sit on. Weird. This may be indicated that it is an unmanned section and it contained cargo or sensor systems. It seems like it was a oh crap we forgot about this bit, though it does mark one of if not the first ships to have this sort of void section between the saucer and the secondary hull. Looking at you, Suitos. Even though the Oberth class is Starfleet, they are often loaned to civilian scientists, such as the SS Vico NAR-18834, which according to Sternbach, indicated a merchant vessel outside of Starfleet. Specialised for scientific missions, the Oberth class still features systems found on other Starfleet vessels, such as transporters, and was even capable of high warp speeds. They utilised specialist shields supplemented by solid victim alloy in the makeup of the bulkheads to maintain the integral structure of the ship, as they often entered dangerous regions of space to study them and were subjected to powerful stresses of powerful spatial anomalies and spatial phenomena. Oberth ships were equipped with numerous science labs in keeping with their primary role as research vessels. One area located in the saucer was a corridor-like chamber filled with science consoles. At the same time, another section, Science Operations, contained multiple computer consoles and even a personal transporter. The bridge, of course, was located in the stupid place, no need to tell you where that is, and shared a layout common to most, a view screen at the front with a side-by-side -side helm and navigation console between that and the captain's chair itself which was situated in the middle of the room. Pretty standard. Primary science station was at the port side of the bridge with secondary consoles across the back wall of the bridge. Communications was stationed on the starboard side, and emergency hatch was set into the bulkhead, which leads directly to space. Because of course it did, why would you put that on the bridge? Maybe it's an airlock, but you get my point, it's still weird. Crew quarters on board comprised the main living area, with attached bedroom and adjacent bathroom. Later warp core technological advancements would see this class begin to phase out in favour of the new Nova class, which could achieve greater speeds with lesser power costs, thanks to its design shape and warp field requirements. The Federation continued the construction as of late 2363, as locations such as the USSR's Baikonur Cosmodrome. Not all Oberth classes were crewed by Starfleet personnel. The SS Vico was operated by an entirely civilian crew, when its hull was sheared off in several places by gravitational wavefronts while exploring the interior of a black cluster, one of the most ancient known astronomical formations in the galaxy. Hull breaches led to the loss of atmosphere on several decks and the entire crew, save for one survivor, a small boy named Timothy. In 2364, the USS Silovoski, NCC 53911, was found by the USS Enterprise D. All crew were dead, infected with a variant of the Psi 2000 virus, whilst monitoring the collapse of a red dwarf star. 
It was cold outside, and they were all alone, more or less. The ship was eventually destroyed when the Enterprise-D used a repulsor beam to push clear a stellar fragment, which hit the Solovsky. The dedication plaque for the ship stated that it was commissioned in 2363, proving that they were still being constructed nearly 80 years after the class's initial launch. Reminds me of the Miranda class, really. The USS Cochrane transported the Oso cheerful retired Admiral Nora Sati to the Enterprise D. It also brought a visiting Wesley Crusher back to the Enterprise whilst he was on vacation from the Academy. She also transported Julian Bashir and Jazia Dax to Deep Space Nine, later seeing action in the Dominion War. The ship awarded numerous casualties to command, with its name, registry, and reported casualties on display on the personnel status update chart in the Deep Space Nine wardroom. We all remember this one that emerged on the final voyage of the NX-01 Enterprise. You know what I mean? This is the USS Pegasus, NCC-53847. Captained by Eric Pressman, the majority of the crew was lost when the CEO ordered them to test an illegal phase cloaking device which directly violated the Treaty of Algeron. We've actually done a full video on the Treaty of Algeron, you can watch it here on the Trek Center YouTube channel. During the trials, an explosion in main engineering occurred, resulting in several crew member casualties. The rest of the crew refused to continue and mutinied. Pressman and a few loyal crew members, including one con officer, Ensign William Riker, fleed in an escape pod. An explosion concluded that the ship and any remaining crew were lost of all hands. The handful of surviving crew were sworn to secrecy by the then captain until the truth came out in 2370. When the roof caved in and the truth came out, Commander Riker didn't know what to do, so he took to the holodeck to mingle with the crew of the NX-01 Enterprise, discover the loyalties to the uniform, ship, crew, and captain, and to do the right thing, even at the expense of oneself. Despite the orders of Admiral Pressman, he told his current CO, Mon Captain Picard, the truth about the experiment that led to the death of his crew and the presumed loss of the ship, which had become phase locked within an asteroid. Pressman, who had avoided justice for so long, was finally arrested, and the Romulans probably had a bit of a headache. Admiral, I am hereby charging you with violation of the Treaty of Algeron. As captain of the Enterprise, I'm placing you under arrest, Mr. Wolf. Admiral, if you will come with me. Captain, I'll have to be placed under arrest as well. Now, as well as those ships, it had been renamed throughout the model's career, beginning with the USS Grissom, which then became the USS Copernicus. Following that, the Solosky became the USS Cochrane, and the final, USS Yosemite. All of the new ships that appeared in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, were designed by the movie's art department, consisting of David Carson and his boss, Nyla Rosdy, and the model shop of the Industrial Light and Magic Department. They looked through the entire outline of the story, trying to identify shots that ILM would be involved in, and how to make them as memorable as possible that would get stuck in your mind, like in an art gallery when something stops you in your tracks. And they did. They gave us the Birth class, which 100% had people wondering, how do you get from there to here? Much like we all did when the USS Cerritos was revealed for Star Trek Lower Decks. Unsurprisingly, the Oberth was designed purely to be cannon fodder for the Klingons. It was to be recognisable as a ship in a fairly same manner as the Excelsior and Enterprise, but did not steal their thunder. As mentioned earlier, the model proved to be far more enduring and went on to be several others from the same class in later iterations of Star Trek. The Oberth class starships were named in honour of the Austro Hungarian born German physicist Hermann Oberth. He is considered one of the founders of modern rocketry and astronautics. SS Viker is the only one to be a separate model to appear severely damaged as it's too valuable to cut up the original. Some models were taken and constructed just to be torn up. The CG model was built for its appearance in the Battle of Sector 001 in Star Trek First Contact. You've got to hand it to all the designers. No matter how short a lifespan or scene, every starship sticks in your mind. You can say, yeah, that one of the four highlighted in the cells and you'll know it's the Shine class. You might not remember the name of the class, but you know what they mean. Though, the Oberth inspired one of the concepts of the Intrepid class USS Voyager, thankfully it didn't get used. We'll stick an image on screen if we can find that one. Unofficially, the Nova class is considered by some production staff as a replacement for the research and science platform of the Oberth. Aptly appearing in Voyager as a ship that replaced one Voyager itself, sort of nearly looked like that, and everyone says that space is too big, honestly. There you have it, the lifespan of the Oberth class. Designed to be can of order, torn up, stuck in a rock, and to deliver a couple of important people to different places. Seems like the job of a transport shuttle, but if you've got a ship lying around to be wasted on a trip, it may as well be an Oberth class. 
If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from my team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. I've been Captain Jack for now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends. Goodbye.